Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 10 a.m. worship service online. And please take note that starting next week, June, we're going to have new schedules for the online uh, live stream or live broadcast of our services. We'll have the Saturday, 4 p.m., and then Sunday, 11 a.m., 2 p.m., and then 5 p.m. And then for those who will be joining us on site, the schedules will be Saturday, 4 p.m., Sunday, 8 a.m., 11 a.m., 2 p.m., and 5 p.m. All right, so we've been journeying through the book of Daniel since April. And today we're doing the last of the six installments of Beyond Kings and Kingdoms. Now, if you haven't missed a Sunday since we started this series and you've completed Daniel chapters one through five or weeks one through five, congratulations on achieving perfect attendance. Type complete in the comment section and let's Give these guys a big round of applause. You know, these are the holiest ones among us. Just kidding. But don't you just feel good to have finished something? And how I wish that we always get to finish what we've started. But it's not always the case, right? Because think of all the books or Udemy courses that we've started but never actually finished. Or maybe the, the leak on the roof that your wife has asked you to put Volca seal on or our plan to declutter this weekend that always gets postponed until next weekend and then the next weekend, or this. Maybe you've, you've experienced this. You, you put leftover food in Tupperware. You put the Tupperware in the fridge, intending to finish it after a few days, and then you forget, and then it, it spoils, and then you throw the food away. You see, we tend to start something with much enthusiasm, until such time that we lose interest. And we tend to leave a lot of things unfinished, don't we? It's okay when it's just food. It's manageable if it's just the roof over our head, but it's sad when it comes to our spiritual life or walk with God because the repercussions of not finishing well or finishing strong could be severe. We've all heard of Christian leaders who fell into financial scandals, sexual immorality, or even heresies, And there seems to be an epidemic of Christians who begin well, but finish poorly. And it's a warning to all of us to never grow complacent. So the question is, how does one finish well? How do we finish the race, stand firm, and endure to the end? How can we run in such a way that we can say with Paul, the Apostle Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And in the text before us today, we will see how Daniel, by the grace of God, had a great beginning and never faltered even towards the end of his life. Remember the first time you met him in chapter 1? That that was like six weeks ago. A teenager, Jewish kid, taken captive to Babylon, faithfully serving the Lord and standing by his convictions in a foreign country. He is now a man in his 80s. So he's been in Babylon for about 70 years, still serving, still being faithful to God. And although he had been taken away as a young teenage boy, although they changed his name, although they changed his education, although his accent changed over the years, and although there had been many changes in the administration, in the empires ruling them during his lifetime, the one thing they couldn't change was his unswerving commitment to God until the very end. And if Daniel were here, what would you ask him? I know what I'd ask him. Daniel, what's the secret to finishing strong in an ungodly culture? And so we'll look into Daniel's life in chapter 6 and learn about the five critical choices that will help us finish strong. And by the way, this is one of our two-year-old son's favorite Bible story, Daniel in the lion's den. But for him, it's Daniel and the lion king. He would always ask his mommy, Mommy, can you read me Daniel and the Lion King? Anyway, Daniel 6, beginning in verses 1 and 2. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to, to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps would give account so that the king might suffer no loss. So here's the new leader, King Darius of the Persian Empire. It's a vast new empire. So he's choosing 120, like maybe mayors or congressmen and women, SK chairman, and over them three governors to manage the, you know, the Luzon, besides Mindanao of the Persian Empire. 
And then Daniel 6.3, we see Daniel uh, coming into the picture here. This Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So Daniel chose to be empowered by the Holy Spirit than rely on his own strength. He chose spirit empowerment over self-reliance. And we see that uh, in the verse, in verse 3. And NASB translation of this verse says that Daniel possessed an extraordinary spirit. So there was more to Daniel than mere intellect. He was a man filled with, this, with the excellent spirit of God. He interpreted dreams. He understood visions. He prophesied. And if he relied on his own strength and abilities alone, he wouldn't be able to do any of those things. Because Colossians 2.3 states that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Daniel's promotion, his success and achievements, people granting him favor from all over the place, these were all made possible because he relied on the Holy Spirit. His reliance on the Holy Spirit made him ten, ten times better than all the magicians of that realm. And it's not a coincidence that most of the discerning, wisest people I know and the ones with the sharpest foresight are also the ones who rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance the most. It's a muscle. It's a muscle that we all have to learn, you know, to rely on the Holy Spirit more than our own strength and abilities. And I love how Alistair Begg described Daniel. He's, he's a pastor in the United Kingdom. That through the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit of God in his life, Daniel became a man of stability in the world that was shaky, a man of purity in a world that was dirty, and a man of integrity in a world that was shady. And that's my prayer for all of us, that we would be men and women of stability, of purity, and integrity. That's not the end of the story though. Because Daniel was distinguished, his colleagues despised him because he was excellent in every way. Their hearts burned with anger and jealousy. And because he lived a life of integrity, they wanted to cancel him. You know, cancel culture, this is nothing new. Daniel experienced it. And so his enemies wanted to get rid of him. And to illustrate this, if you're an average student like I was, there's nothing worse than having a classmate who always gets a perfect score on the exams, right? Because the teacher couldn't bring the standard down, couldn't lower the standard for the rest of us mere mortals because there's somebody who's always excellent. So Daniel was like that. He was cut above the rest. He's the overachiever of the overachievers. And don't you find it amazing that even after having served for 70 or more years, people still can find a hint of negligence or corruption in his record? Amazing. So what did Daniel's colleagues do? The satraps or the satraps set the trap in motion. You get that? Satraps set the trap. You know, that's why they're called satraps. They would appeal to the king's ego. They would say nice words about him. And the, the plan is to get the king to sign a proclamation or a memorandum of agreement, if you may, that says that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except to King Darius, shall be cast into the den of lions. And we might wonder, why do they hate Daniel so much? You know why? They hated him, not because he was a bad fellow, but because he stood for truth. And then when they would join him, they couldn't stand him because there was no gap between his public and private life. And if you'd spend time with him eating in the cafeteria or talking with the palace stuff, or driving his chariot, he's the same person. A godly person through and through. You know what? A godly person living a godly life in an ungodly or pagan culture will always invite persecution. That's the truth. In 2 Timothy 3.12, we see that. That indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But even in the face of persecution, we can press on through the empowering grace of the Holy Spirit. And in Daniel's case, he continued to live for God in the midst of persecution and made critical choices that helped him endure to the end. So the second uh, choice that Daniel made that helped him finish strong, we see that in Daniel 
uh, chapter 6, verse 10. So when Daniel knew that the document, you know, the agreement or, or the bill or the law had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So we're thinking windows, jealousy or capiz, we don't know. But he didn't have blinds or curtains for sure. But the point is, he did not close the windows to hide what he was doing because he was not ashamed of his faith or God. And he bowed toward Jerusalem. So he was facing west with maybe a beautiful view of the sunset because God promised to hear the prayers of the exiles who faced toward Jerusalem when they prayed. And we see that in 1 Kings chapter 8. So he was praying on behalf of their nation, repenting to God for the error of their ways and turning to him and crying out to him. And he knelt down, right? You know, I'm only in my 30s and my knees are not as strong as before. And I kind of envy Daniel because at 80 plus years of age, he still was able to get down on his knees, showing humility before God and dependence on him. And he gave thanks to God. And you see, even on the most challenging days, we can still give thanks to our Lord and Savior for all that he has done for us. And finally, uh, in verse 10, we see this important note that he did all these things as he had done previously. New Living Translation, just as he had always done. Or New King James Version, as was his custom since early days. So Daniel prayed, not as a reaction to the new law and not because of a crisis, but because that's what he's always done. He chose disciplines over hype. All right, what do I mean by hype? Um, if this is your photo and you're here today, my apologies, I just saw this picture online of this hairstyle. But you know, thank God, it, it's not uh, a trend anymore. It's not uh, the hype anymore, right? It's not a cool thing anymore, this hairstyle. But you know what? Hype is about exaggerating. Hype is sporadic and unpredictable. Hype is the opposite of consistent. Hype is about having short bursts of enthusiasm for the Lord that doesn't last. And hype in our walk with God looks like this. You know what, Pastor? It's so hard to worship God today because I don't like the way they sing. Or you know what? Your subject and verb don't always agree, Pastor. How can you inspire me to read the scripture? If you're not excellent, I better move to a different church. Or maybe it's like this. I'm struggling with sinful habits because my accountability group doesn't check in on me as much as before. That's the picture of how we choose to have this hype, hype attitude in our walk with God. But Daniel's walk with God was not based on hype. The quality of his walk with God didn't depend on the circumstances around him. His life was marked with steady consistency. And people tend to think that the idea of forming habits is not a good idea because it's legalistic in a way. Well, taking a bath every day is not about legal, legalism, right? It's for the person's own good and our good, especially if he's going to attend a worship service on site, right? And in the same way, we spend time on the Word of God in prayer. We spend time engaging others with the gospel and we spend time serving others because these things are part of who we are as, as Christ followers. Disciplines are a part of who we are. So Daniel chose disciplines over hype. Now thirdly, Daniel 6.12 they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. And in verse 13, Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. So it's no longer Daniel, our leader, or Daniel, the governor. No, Daniel, the exile from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. First of all, it wasn't true that Daniel paid no attention to the king. He's always respected the king. He has served him well. But being faithful to God was more important to Daniel 
than receiving favors and bowing down to the king. And Daniel chose eternal over earthly rewards. That's the point. Because he could have rationalized it like God, the king would have made me the prime minister of the whole empire. Imagine the kind of influence that your kingdom could exercise through me. Or God, you know, it's only for 30 days. I've been faithful for the last 70, 70 plus years. And I hope it's okay with you if I take a month off, you know, just 30 days. But no, Daniel didn't compromise. And he chose and, and kept on choosing eternal over earthly rewards. If you're an artist today, or maybe you're a public servant, or a student, or a business person, whatever platform God has given you, one of the most liberating things is to understand that we don't have to work for the applause of people, the likes, and the money. It's liberating when we begin to understand that we can offer our best work for the glory of God alone. And I love this quote about the famous composer Johann Sebastian Bach that encapsulates this whole idea of us giving glory to the Lord. And it says that while today we recognize Johann Sebastian Bach as one of the greatest composers who ever lived, his work wasn't celebrated until long after his death. But the lack of recognition didn't appear to face him. At the end of his compositions, back inscribed the Latin phrase soli Deo Gloria, meaning glory to God alone, a reminder to back and history of why he created, of why he composed, composed songs and whose recognition he sought. Again, may we seek eternal over earthly rewards. Moving on, Daniel 6, 14 and 15. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. And King Darius was like, there's got to be a, some way to fix this mess because he's friends with Daniel, right? And if, maybe if we can get some lawyers in here or maybe if we can call some senators and then have them vote on this, maybe we can save Daniel. But then eventually the king realized that there was nothing he could do except executing this irreversible decree and sending Daniel into the lion's den. So verse 16, then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, may your God, Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. That was King Darius's prayer over Daniel. And Daniel, as you see in this picture, he didn't resist the arrest. He didn't retaliate. It seems like he's not bothered at all by the punishment and it's death, death penalty, okay? And it doesn't affect him whatsoever that they will throw him into the lion's den. Why? Because he chose to rest in the security of God over revenge. That's the fourth critical choice. If we want to finish strong, if we want to finish well, rest over revenge. And while the king couldn't sleep in his comfortable bed in the palace, Daniel had a wonderful time in the den with ferocious lions. And here's an insight or a truth that I'd like to share with us. When we are faced with danger, the safest place to be is in obedience to God. So the, verse 19, the next morning, the king went in haste. He was rushing. They didn't even brush his teeth. They didn't even say good morning to his wife or wives. And then verse 20, King Darius shouts, Daniel, Daniel. Of course, he was hoping that Daniel was still alive. So Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And miraculously, Daniel responds. And here was Daniel's response. Are you kidding me, King Darius? You should have been with me and my best buddies here, Simba and Mufasa. We just sang Hakuna Matata the whole night. You, would, you wouldn't believe it, King. Can you feel the love tonight, King Darius? That's not what he said, okay? Daniel 6, 21, 22. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. 
and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. And so Daniel 6.23, the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. So finally, the fifth choice, if we want to finish strong, we get it from the example of Daniel. He chose love over life. He chose love for God over the preservation of his own life. And Daniel survived, not because the lions were toothless, not because they weren't hungry, not because he was able to hide in a crevice or under a haystack. No, no, no. All those aren't true, okay? Those are fake news. But he, he survived because he trusted in God. And God sent an angel to close up the mouths of the lions. And here's the truth that I want us to leave with today, that God will preserve our lives until He decides that our mission is over. How do you know whether your mission on earth is finished? Simple. If you're alive, it isn't. And if you're here today, God has a plan for your life. Exodus 23, 26, I will fulfill the number of your days. And with God, we will always be in a win-win situation because He can deliver us from harm. He can deliver us even from death. But if He chooses not to, we are delivered big time. Why? Because we'll see Him face to face in an instant. Like Isaiah, right? Isaiah loved God but was sought into. Peter loved God but was crucified upside down. They weren't delivered from their own versions of the lion's den, but they chose to love God until the very end. And God delivered them, not from that um, situation or circumstance, but God delivered them into His presence to be with Him forever. And here's another example. We're so fortunate that one of the earliest known Christian documents, the martyrdom of Polycarp, has been preserved. If you're a Pokemon fan, by the way, Polycarp is not the brother of Magikarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. And John had ordained him as a bishop of Smyrna in modern-day Turkey. So Polycarp was arrested by the Roman officials. They were going to burn him at the stake unless he renounced Christianity. So that was a condition to recant and to renounce your faith. But Polycarp refused. And fixing his eyes upon the Roman official, the old man Polycarp gave his final words before he was burned. He said, 80 and six years have I served him, have I served God. And he never once, he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? So again, daily choose to love God over our own lives. Then finally, Daniel 6, 25 to 27, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. And the whole empire heard about God through the king's decree. And Daniel's uncompromising to commitment to choose spirit empowerment over self-reliance, disciplines over hype, eternal over earthly rewards, rest over revenge, love over life, resulted in worship. In our fallen nature, our default response is to be self-reliant. We tend to choose hype and short and sporadic bursts of enthusiasm for the Lord instead of developing robust spiritual disciplines. And we tend to seek earthly over eternal rewards and we'd want to put matters into our own hands and take vengeance on those who have wronged us and we'd like to live safe and secure lives even at the expense of being a witness for God. But there's something so beautiful about God that we would be willing to give our whole lives to Him just as He has given His life for us. And I pray 
that we will discover that for ourselves, that God is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to no end or to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth that he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions can also deliver us from the power of evil, sin, and death. We can continue to choose God because he has chosen us, because he's been faithful to us. And so may we finish strong as we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith and the one who began a good work in us and bring it to completion. As we take time to pray, I want to pray for two groups of people right now. First group of people, this, this is kind of sobering because there are some of us I believe that the Lord is knocking on the door of your hearts and, and today's the day that you need to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think about the satraps and how their lives tragically ended. They were cast into the den, den of lions and before they even reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces. And I don't want to disregard the truth that there's a judgment reserved for those who, re who reject God and seek to oppose His work, just like the satraps. And on the day when Christ returns, there will be shouts of joy on the part of those who are ready to meet Him, and there will be cries of anguish on those who realize that they have never bowed their knees before Him. And the question is, have you received Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior? And the Bible consistently says that now is the accepted time and today is the day of salvation. And today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So let's pray. Lord, wherever we may be right now, I pray that, that we would receive you, Lord. If we haven't surrendered our lives to you yet, I pray that we would yield to you, that we would humble ourselves, repent of our sins, and admit today, that you are the Lord of lords, that you are the King of kings, and we need you as our Savior in our lives. So we thank you, Lord, for all those who have given their lives to you today. May you bless them. May you uh, lavish them with your love, starting today in Jesus' name. Amen. Another group of people that I'd like to uh, pray for today are those who are in the lion's den kind of situation right now. No, there's this story, it's a true story, by the way, of Corrie Ten Boom. She was sent to a concentration camp that was during the World War II because she hid, uh, she, she was guilty of hiding Jews in her home in Holland. And in this concentration camp, she experienced unspeakable suffering. She even grieved the death of her friends and dear sister Betsy. But she had this to say, that if you are in a lion's end kind of situation right now, this is what um, Te Corey Ten Boom had to say. She said, There is no place on earth so dark and deep that God's love is not deeper still. Let me pray for you, Lord, for our friends today who are watching, who have joined us. I pray, Father, for your grace to sustain them in this difficult and challenging season or circumstance they're in. We trust, Lord, that your grace would be sufficient for them. I pray, Father, that you would grant them relief and even deliverance, Lord. And I pray that in this difficult time they're in, I pray that you would be glorified, that people would see how, how consistently we're still worshiping and loving you. And God, I pray that in this difficult moment that our friends are in right now, I pray, Father, that you would touch them and that you would draw them even closer to you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in our lives. We love you. We bring you back all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining our online worship service today. God bless you.